So, first of all, uh, you're all welcome here to Engineers Ireland. A um, couple of housekeeping rules or uh, information. Exit at the front, exit at the back, in case we have to leave suddenly. Um, microphones, uh, we'll kind of hopefully keep questions to the end. So we'll have the panel up here at the front um, and we'll have somebody roaming with a microphone to um, get your questions. The reason for the microphones is uh, so people online can actually hear the actual questions. Um, okay, first of all, I'm Paul Dillon. I'm the current chair of the uh, Mechanical and Manufacturing Division of Engineers Ireland and also represent uh, the Republic of Ireland branch of uh, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. Um, part of the committee's kind of remit is to look at manufacturing and uh, mechanical engineering developments, and one of which obviously has to be additive manufacturing or, and 3D printing, which has certainly grabbed uh, kind of public appeal. So um, we had a talk uh, before Christmas from Professor Jerry Byrne, and uh, he put up 10 points for discussion, and one of which was on this idea of additive manufacturing. So uh, we've kind of picked the team of manufacturing for, the last, for this series, so we're trying to address this point. So hopefully we'll have some discussion at the end, okay? Um, what we're looking to see is that, are, is there opportunities here in Ireland that we can follow or develop, um, maybe catch the wave of 3D printing, or are we too late in a way? Uh, we'll wait and see. So our first speaker is uh, Shane, I should say Dr. Shane Keevney, <laughs> uh, who recently got his PhD from mechanical engineering. I'm not going to go into his uh, title, but it was to do with five axis milling, CNC, CNC machining. Um, so uh, Shane graduated from UCD June 2010, uh, honors in mechanical engineering. Um, he's now currently working for SolidCam in the UK. Solid, yeah, based in Ireland. Well, based in Ireland for SolidCam UK. So. Okay. So, so I'll uh, let Shane introduce his topic. Good. Well, thanks very much uh, for coming along this evening. Uh, and yeah, I'm Dr. Uh, Dr. Shane Kevney. So I'm actually an applications engineer with SolidCam UK, but I'm based here in Ireland for them. So I'm working for the Irish customers, kind of. Um, but I'm also then um, doing. I'm also doing some research with uh, UCD and um, bioengineering as well. So my, um, I'm just I'm just gonna go through basically here our um, quick agenda. So I want to just talk about my motivation for kind of an interest in this area, uh, and then give a kind of an overview and a kind of a history. I'm not going to go into too uh, too deep on technical uh, sort of results or something, some of stuff we've been doing, but I just want to give a, a an overview so we can have a good discussion at the end then about where we should go um, and also I'll talk about the actual CAD CAM printing process and then look at the various applications. Um, I think the really interesting thing about 3D printing is the fact that there's such a wide scope of um, areas that it hits So, and I'm going to look at that later and then we'll have a kind of conclusion discussions towards the end. So. The first thing, just to come back to, so my, my PhD is in 5-axis CNC machining, um, and what I was looking at there was with Dupuy and Cork on the machining of their knee inserts. So I was looking at the whole CAD CAM CNC machining um, sort of process chain, we'll call it. And the interesting thing is that um, 3D printing basically is fits in a similar kind of scheme. So we have a CAD CAM CNC system with 5-axis machining, we're just we're machining material away using a, a similar type of robot. Um, and then with um, printing, we're adding material on or additive manufacturing. And for me, um, CAD CAM CNC is my real kind of um, interest area or my kind of speciality. So I'm really interested in sort of um, how we go from the CAD to the actual CNC control to generate a part. And within, within milling, there's kind of, um, there's a lot of different things we have to consider. Uh, like you know, setting up the tools, setting up fixtures, uh, stock material, and that's one of the great things. Then with additive manufacturing, we basically we don't have to think about tools, calibrating tools, uh, get setting up fixturing. There's there's no real stock. It's just like a, f a feed. So it removes a lot of the kind of areas that cause issues, and where they cause issues is actually in the the cam side. So. With um, again with machining, we have to consider like a lot of stuff about the process. So the the CAM programmer has a lot of work to do. Whereas with three D printing, the CAM process is quite um, quite straightforward and it's 
pretty much automatic and automatic cam is something that um, CNC milling should sort of try to strive to get towards as well. I think 3D printing is actually pushing it a bit to say, you know, when can cam for machining become more automatic. The other really interesting thing about printing is the lack of forces, So, well, minimal forces. So again with machining, um, for the cam side, it's um, it, it, it thinks just really generally about the geometry, so it's a kind of geometry based calculation of a path that will, you know, you cut away material and you, and you get your curve or whatever. Um, but when you're actually machining, you end up with like um, a lot of forces in there and this is for a lot of, man, of sort of different process and like grinding or milling. If the process forces come into it um, and the cam doesn't consider it, and it leads to some kind of issues then with printing we generally don't we don't have really too many forces or we've kind of nil forces so it um it kind of gets rid of this issue so that's one of the that's one of the cool things from the cam doesn't have to consider it too much but also then it reduces the actual kind of um the kind of requirements for the machine itself uh, I'm going to show some of the low-cost systems for printing, which are quite nice in desktop uh, systems. Whereas with CNC machines, to produce whatever small enough parts, you still need big, rigid machines because of these forces. So, so yeah, so that's the kinematic sort of sort of CNC side is my expertise. So kind of kinematic errors, so the alignment of the machine, uh, the CNC accuracy of the control system and stuff, and also then the CAD CAM CNC process. And yeah, my motivation then. A sort of low cost um, manufacturing sustainability and also one of very one of the areas I'm keen on is assistive devices and um, which we'll I'll talk a bit about towards the end and also then the idea of hybrid CNC processing I think this is something that's really coming out to the fore um, kind of so generally we think about um, milling um, just to milling as a whole or having grinding separately but now you'll see um, Marasiki have invested quite a lot in their sort of hybrid system where they have milling and additive manufacturing in one. And this is kind of what I see as the next step where we have CNC systems with multiple um, material processing capabilities that allow us to generate, you know, parts much more efficiently. So that's, uh, yeah. So a quick, just for anyone, just it's, I'm going to give a quick overview just on the actual printing. So it was 1984, it was kind of the SLA is the, I'll explain in a minute, but that was like the first kind of printing method, then moved on to some different systems, and then I think in uh, 1999 with the first blather, blather, and then in 2005, RepRap, which is the whole like DIY kind of home, homegrown type stuff, maker type stuff was kind of, um, you know, invented, and it's, it's just shot up in popularity ever since, and it's actually what's driven the kind of whole uh, public awareness of printing, which is quite cool. Um, and then yeah, we have some we have uh, some other stuff there. Um, printing of houses in two thousand and four, and also um, skull transplant and stuff. But there's there's it's, there's a lot of stuff. I'll go through some more of the applications in a minute. But it's a it's a technology that's that's now starting to to come. Um, and one of the other cool, I just thought I'd put up this slide. It's um kind of with traditional manufacturing, as the complexity of the part uh, starts to go up. Uh, our costs also go up, but in, with 3D printing, its complexity doesn't affect the cost too much. Um, and also with that, then the uh, kind of uh, bringing out to market, then it, it's the costs don't go, don't, don't rise as much. So it's quite good from that point of view as well. So yeah, the low cost systems I was talking about. So um, I'm sure all of you have seen. We, well, the, these are outside, and this this is like um, the kind of uh, FDM, uh, which I'll explain in a minute. It's, kind of one of the most popular ones with the maker type and then we have an SLA system which is uh, quite an accurate a high res a resolution system but still I think comes in around 3,000 euro or something so it's okay for home users and these are again around 1,500 or something and then this is also these are all, this, so these are polymers but there is a um, there is a kind of a low-cost metal alternative which uh, I think it's university in, in America has uh, has looked at its like fifteen hundred dollars or something. It's uh, it's it's not on sale. It's the plans are there, but it uses a, a kind of a, a MIG welder and a kind of an X Y stage to produce reasonably good um, metal parts. So if you had some DIY kind of uh, shop where they wanted to do some low cost metal printing, it's a uh, it's an option. So there is options there. So just the different. I'll just go through the different types then. So we have. Um, Laminated object manufacturing, like the uh, was the 
kind of the paper type thing. So basically we lay on <coughs> sheets of paper and we um, glue it together and then we, we cut the shape out on each layer with the laser or something like this. Uh, and then we have uh, selective laser sintering, um, for mainly for metals or polymers, where we basically have particles that we sinter together. Then there's also um, selective sort of melting, where we melt the particles together. And the most advanced sort of metal printing at the moment would be from ArcCam, where we have electron beam melting, where similar to this, we uh, use an electron beam to melt uh, metal particles together. And we just kind of, uh, we just roll the, a layer of particles over and keep building it up then, so. And then we have SLA, which I was saying was one of the first. So it's a curable resin uh, in a tank, and we use a laser light then to cure it. Uh, I think you can also use a DP. There's a, d a different light sources you can use to get different resolutions on this. This would be like the uh, the Form 1 system. Uh, it gives really nice kind of uh, resolution and really nice parts, but again, it's in polymer, so. Uh, and then we have the fused deposition modeling, which is FDM. Um, and this works kind of like, um, it basically layers, lays down like layers of polymer. Um, so we have a filament feed and we lay down, these could be like, say 0.4 width, and maybe 0.1 high or something, lays them uh, on top of each other in layers and it's able to build up the profile. This, this is a popular um, method with makers and also gives quite nice um, kind of parts and you can get really nice results off this. Uh, this is at the moment one of the areas, one of the kind of techniques I'm looking at because of its flexibility. Uh, the feed material is quite easy to change the feed material. Um, and also it gives um, particularly strong parts, but some of the stuff we're looking at is kind of um, the actual overlap of these um, these lines, we'll say. So if you look on here, you'll see the way it's normally done is they're kind of laid up on top of each other like this. We're looking at um, trying to lay them, sort of offset them from each other, um, you know, so that we can try to minimize some of these voids and try to put some compressive forces in more when we're actually laying it down to get better actual bonding um, so that we can kind of control the, the layer bond strength a bit better. So this is something we're looking at and also looking at more kind of advanced then sort of tool paths. So this is, they're normally sliced, um, you know, sliced in kind of 2D. Um, so you take 2D profiles and you build them up and up, but we're looking at, can we add some, say if we want to finish a certain surface, can we add in like a, a 3D type path in there for finishing the surface? So build like a structure underneath first and then come back like you would in milling and actually follow the contour of the surface to give us a better finish. So I think there's there's cool opportunities in here just because of its, its flexibility and, and low cost. So it's one of the areas I'm focused on at the moment. And then yeah, that just lays out the, the kind of system. So you take a, a 3D CAD model, uh, you convert it into an SDL, you basically then slice it into these layers like I was saying. And this is what makes the cam really, really easy because you just break it up into layers and then you just have to build up these layers so the cam has very little to do. And then you can use whatever, you, you know, your SLA or your um, FDM or whatever. Um, one, of it's, one of the funny things is that um, it used to be like, so a traditional manufacturing, you're kind of limited by the manufacturing technique. So for designers, they have to consider the manufacturing technique quite a lot, you know, so they're going to be able to machine it or grind it or whatever. Um, but with, um, with kind of 3D printing, it's come back more towards the designer. And I think that's one of the things we should talk about is like, how should we consider the design model now is the bit that is kind of the complicated part and we don't have that much limitations in there. So it's really challenging designers as to how they're going to design parts, you know. We'll look at some stuff later that, that shows like the kind of freedom we have now, but it's, you know, it really opens up the design side. And I think it's a bit of a gap as well, the model and like it's, it's still a complicated enough process to, to make to generate um, really complicated surfaces, so I think it's kind of a gap in there. So yeah, so some of the applications. Then you know we have. I'm sure you've seen all this stuff, but we have like the 3D printed house. It's uh, I think so. What was it? Ten houses in 24 hours in uh, Shanghai in China. So just using a large printer. There, it's also recycled uh, waste materials, which is pretty good. Um, so it's good for low cost housing, and maybe someday they'll be able to be used for actual construction of our houses and take out the labor costs, which would be good. Um, we also have food, which is actually a really interesting one. Um, and this is, a, this is an okay example, but I think the um, more interesting one is Hershley's new chocolate printer. 
so for doing cakes and stuff you know if you think about decorating of cakes and they also have a, a printer for doing sugar as well so you can get really really cool um edible parts you know so it's 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 pretty cool i think it's a little bit of a niche and it's starting to come out now as well like hershley's you'll see hershley's have their new printer and then also we have the 3d print well it's 3d printed car but it's it's basically the the shell of the car is printed and it's i think it's a it's a twizzy a renault twizzy and electric car underneath so the major components are not printed it's it's just the body and some of the other bits but it's, it's a nice example so kind of consumer stuff and then you have the more interesting applications so the medical stuff so this here is actually a cartilage um, kind of grown and it was actually done on a MakerBot so they used a MakerBot system to to do this and a MakerBot was one of the kind of low cost systems I think this is for a child it's for uh, replacing part of the trachea and it's quite an interest or quite a difficult geometry to actually um, manufacture and prototype but using 3D printing it really helped them to to, to make it which is cool and then this one's really good as well it's a, it's actually a heart what they've done is say they took a scan of a, a child I think they had um, born with a lot of holes in their heart or something um, and then they were able to basically use 3D printing to print the heart see where all the holes were so they could prep for surgery and I think this is a really cool application for surgeons to actually prep before they get get into the surgery um, and then they were able to know exactly where all the holes were and do a very quick surgery with lower, lowering the risk. This is an actual ear which was grown um, and it has, I think, a silver, silver nano particles or something in there as well. So it can actually receive radio waves at the moment, but it's, it's grown, so it's kind of tissue stuff. And then this is a bone scaffold as well, so they use the printer to ge generate the scaffold and have the bone in there, so cool medical applications. Uh, and then you have more um, the high tech stuff. So this this would be from Layerwise, um, a company in the Netherlands to do extremely high quality metal printing. Um, and the interesting thing about this is again what I was saying about designers. These are all cooling channels within a part. So the way we think about how we design parts now is is just totally. Um, it's just you know there's the freedom is so large. Like how do you kind of constrain what you're going to do? You know, um, and then with the cost is not f affecting the cost that much. Um, quite cool so the quality of metal parts we can get off this is insane and then some of the printing in space stuff which is cool they can just send a file up to the space station um, print off whatever they need recycle it then probably so uh, and then we have another some nice applications the a jaw which was printed and uh, some examples of uh, it's a hip um, and this is a, I think there's a hip cup as well so some high, more high-end stuff uh, and then we have some of the assistive devices, like this is a cast here, um, designed, it's, it's kind of a breathe, the cool thing about this is it's, it's breathable um, and it matches the shape better. It, I think it takes like three hours to print opposed to a standard cast, but um, it's, quite, it's, quite, it's quite nice. Um, and then this is a, more of an artistic, a, a prosthesis that was um, pros a prosthetic uh, le hand, I think it is, so it was designed for more for, for look. And then, Really cool thing as well. I'm gonna play this little video, which is pretty cool. Bring that up. Um, so, oh, sorry, yeah, uh, yeah. So the reason the reason I'm putting this up is just a nice. I'm gonna just flick on a bit. It's actually a nice example of um, so that that we can get quite flexible parts. This is actually done with FDM as well, I think. So the material. Materials range is, is what's really cool. This is quite a flexible material, and then also the way it's designed is for when someone moves their wrist that they can actually have a hand action. So say if they uh, lost their hand or something and just have a stump, they can, we can start to, for low cost, get them back some mobility. And also this material feels quite nice and um, uh, skin-like. The way they've printed it with their, their fill amount, it's quite soft and it, it's nice on the touch. So this, the materials is the big side, and that's again why uh, FDM I think is really cool because the, f the flexibility for materials is, is totally open there. So this is quite, a, a, quite an impressive print. So um, and I'll flick on because the time is kind of, I'll just uh, go back to my, there we go. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah, and then, then we have the kind of challenges around 3D printing. Uh, something I was saying to someone yesterday when we were going through this was um, 
a lot of technologies kind of are developed sort of war and sort of um, stuff like this kind of helps them to be developed like even I think CNC machining originally in the 1950s or 60s is when it first kind of originated but I think it was for machining of air, aircraft blades for helicopters um, for the US Army or something like this 3D printing is kind of it's kind of the opposite you know it's, it's not been uh, not been developed that way I think the army are starting to see start to become interested in it but it's it's gone the other way and um, I suppose their question is how to protect it from you know becoming more sinister um, I think the 3D printed gun is you know something that always comes up um, and it's this kind of capability that people now have in their homes to manufacture whatever they want and the questions around should there be licenses for to own a 3D printer or some sort of qualification that you you know you're not going to use it for bad and then also there's the IP issues around um, clothing and whatever shoes whatever products that how's it going to kind of change the way we think about products um, are we going like are we going to go to a store and buy stuff or is it going to be um, kind of emailed to us or how will we interact with it is it going to be everything custom designed and it's mass customization will it become reality um, so it's, it's, it really opens up a lot of kind of areas, sort of social, political, regulations. There's, there's so much stuff that it's going to challenge, you know, and we need to be kind of prepared for that. So, uh, And then, yeah, just, that's kind of my summary there on, on that. So kind of engineers' response to something as, as I make key we should think about, and Engineers Ireland as well, as to what, how, we, how should we respond in terms of education for engineers to be prepared, in terms of, like, more, um, you know, design and stuff like this and then also there's the regulations around safety and IP control um, and then as I said education and then our impa impact on society so there's there's a lot of things that we should start to consider now so that we're prepared and also then as Paul was saying what's our, our niche here in Ireland so so I'd like to thanks for listening uh, and then I think hopefully we have questions at the end so thank you very much. Thanks, Shane. Um, okay, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Tom Walls. Um, Tom is the MD of uh, Laser Prototype Europe in Belfast, uh, LPE. Um, and Tom has graduated at Queen's University. He's worked for a number of aerospace companies, including Westland Helicopter, Short Brothers, Boeing, and Bombardier. He founded LPE in 1991, and it was one of the first, it was the first. Yeah company to have an SLS printer in Europe, I do believe. Uh, first EOS SLS printer. <laughs> <coughs> so, we have to be yeah. very particular. Um, and also he's been very kind to us in uh, coming down to us from Belfast to deliver uh, the next section. Tom. All right, okay. Uh, sorry, uh, is that, how do you get it on show? Yep. Sorry. Yep. No, that's, I, I closed it. Sorry, sorry got to get it from the desktop, sorry. Sorry. I closed it, sorry. Yeah, it's on the desktop, sorry. You get there. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> All right, so, yeah, I'm uh, Tom Walls. Uh, this fits it. Yeah, point it at the screen. Point it at the screen to turn it. Yep. Sorry. Mm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, <coughs> hopefully, I'm, you know, I'm going to go over a wee bit of what Shane uh, spoke about there earlier on. So hopefully, I'll not step in too much of what he talked about. So I just really want to sort of recap quickly on terminology because uh, everybody. You know, people nowadays, at the last exhibition I was at, somebody came up to me and said, oh, Flip, this is fantastic, this 3D printing, you can make metal parts from MakerBots. And the fact of the matter is that, you know, MakerBot, as Shane pointed out, only came around in 2005. So there's a lot of confusion over terminology, and I just want to quickly recap. <clears throat> from 1990 to 2000, really, the industry was referred to as rapid prototyping. And re really that's because most of the applications were prototyping, the materials were limited, they were acrylic based. And then around about 2000 to 2010, people started to move it into manufacturing to, you know, to real live applications. And then people started to refer to it as additive manufacturing. But in, in essence, it was still the same technologies. 
And then as the uh, patents ran out on the FDM machines and a lot of the cheap printers came in, everybody started referring to it as 3D printing. And in America, there's a lot of debate all the time about what the industry should be called. So in 2010, the ASTM F42 committee defined additive manufacturing as making objects from 3D data, usually layer, <coughs> layer upon layer, and 3D printing as fabrication of objects through the deposition of a material using a printhead nozzle. So theoretically, that's the um, <coughs> ASTM definition of the processes. And going back over a wee bit what Shane said there, there was really essentially, what I've highlighted here is uh, what was the position in 1995. So in 1995, essentially, you had, um, is it, uh, you had um, four technologies, <coughs> star lithography. And if you go back to 1995, the cost of the equipment back in 1995 was roughly 200,000 euros to 800,000 euros. Now you have <coughs> polyjet machines. Essentially, the first two machines are laser. The first one is a laser liquid, and the second one is a laser powder. Uh, the laser powder machines, they started around about 250,000 euros and went up to 1.5 million. And the FDM machines, which is the uh, fused deposition modeling, which is the one that a lot of the cheap printers are now uh, sort of are copies of, um, started around about 10,000 pounds to 500,000 pounds. And when we sort of look at those three there, you know, the star lithography, 200,000 to 800,000, I mean, that is the price of a star lithography machine today. But the big difference is today, the machine that you're buying today and the, is going to build five times faster than what you got in uh, 1995. And the material properties are probably about five times better. And the accuracy is much improved. The one other process there is the loam, which is a paper lamination process, and it's fallen in and out of favour over the years. Um, it's back in now uh, in Ireland here with MCOR, who produce a very good paper-based machine. But the other thing I just wanted to highlight there was, <coughs> if you look at that, in, 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 1990, in 1995, there was actually eight manufacturers selling machines in the US, and to those eight, there's only three still selling machines. So who is LPE? Uh, we set up in 1991, uh, specifically as an additive manufacturing bureau from scratch. That was our only business. Uh, we offer a full range of industrial printing. Um, just if I just flick back to there, I mean, as far for, for people service bureaus, we refer to industrial printing really as star lithography and laser centering. People will argue with me and say FDM is an industrial printer, but the big difference between the laser-based systems and the other systems is that you can improve with speed. So once you want to go up in volume, it generally has to be a laser-based system. Uh, we actually have the widest range of materials available within, within Ireland and within the UK. Our average lead time is two to four days. Uh, again, just thinking about two to four days and people talk about rapid prototyping and 3D printing. I mean, I just had a quick look there before I came down, but at the weekend, we built 1,500 parts, 1,500 individual parts that were received either on a Thursday and Friday, and all those parts will go out probably Monday or Tuesday. Uh, almost 40% of our business nowadays comes from direct, uh, direct parts and tooling, so it's not just prototyping. Uh, we're an ISO 13485, IS 9002, and we're starting the process of IS 9100. We're actively involved in R&D, <coughs> both north and south. Uh, we're a member of a thing called the Northern Ireland Advanced Composite Centre. Uh, we have a project, uh, actually it's a five-axis sub five subtractive project with the University of Ulster. And we're just starting a project with the Athlone Institute of Technology on a tooling project in the Applied Polymer Centre. Uh, the processes that we have is star lithography, selective laser centering, and uh, just starting in March, we will have DMLS, laser cusing. So those are our three principal uh, additives, additive services. Then in combination with those, we combine those with a process called vacuum casting to produce short production runs. Uh, we have five axis CNC, and we have rem, resin inje uh, reaction injection molding where a person's looking for maybe, say, 50 to 1,000 parts, and we use the star lithography masters or the SLS. And then we have a full finishing painting service. Paul had asked me if I could sort of show examples and why people chose those examples. So what I'm going to try and do is just quickly sort of show over the years, <coughs> sort of from 1991 up to date, of, of sort of the applications that our customers are using the parts for. 
Uh, so it sort of show you how as the materials have improved and machines have improved, you'll see how the applications have moved more into industry, more into direct parts and more into manufacturing. So uh, initially in the early stages, we did a lot of concept models. Uh, today we still would do architectural models. Uh, we would mostly use SLS for that, but equally SLA is used. I mean, um, and also FDM is used. FDM is equally as good for making architectural models. The, a good example, thinking again what Paul was asking me for to show an example why would somebody use one process. I think it was around about 2005, <coughs> U2 were going to do, there was a thing called the U2 tower. So we actually did all these models for that and they were in stereolithography because they wanted it to be uh, water clear, they wanted it to be clear, it was a twisted tower. Never actually went through, I think there was a problem with planning permission. But that's an example where we use stereolithography for uh, architectural. But most of the stuff, in my opinion, SLS is a very, very good process for architectural because you have no support structure on it and you won't break the part taking it off. Uh, the other part over there is actually a part that was actually at the uh, Farm Show in 2014. And we chose SLA for that process. That uh, particular company had been machining those from aluminium. Uh, we chose it as SLA. We hollowed it out. Uh, it would give them a big weight saving, but it actually gave them a huge saving in, in, in cost. If you look at the fit form function, people quickly went on to move it for fit form function. And for us, the sort of early adopters that were, were using it at that time were F1, Formula One, and consumer products. The likes of people like Black and & Decker and Dyson and uh, Triton Shars, uh, you know, a lot of consumer product companies, Glen Dimplex would have been using it. So people very quickly adopted it to, to use for fit form function. Um, and in addition to that, they were using it for like uh, communication tools with tool makers, and, and uh, quite as well, quite often in the early stages, we were getting people just to make parts so they could get them down to the assembly line and time how long it was taking to make an assembly to do work studies for the production engineers to set the price. Once it sort of got into the companies, and again, when I'm sort of talking through a lot of this, I'm thinking specifically of the Formula One industry and how they continue to develop it in-house. So once it sort of got in, we found that people uh, to want to do functional testing. It moved on into the design and development and the R&D groups. So in the very early stages, in 1990, 1991 to 1995, you couldn't have used the sterilithography models for functional testing because the material properties weren't good enough. Um, but <clears throat> the resins were slightly hydroscopic. But as the resins moved on, then the applications improved. And you could actually use them for water and oil flow tests. Uh, the parts are used for destructive and non-destructive testing. There's an awful lot of airflow parts used. And then once the parts <coughs> were starting to be seen within the design and test departments and the R&D departments, the manufacturing guys who previously would have been making those parts, they previously would have machined them or maybe fabricated them up or whatever, they then started to look at them and, and started to sort of say, what is this uh, rapid prototyping and additive manufacturing? And as they started to understand it, then they realized that they could utilize it. So they started to, the manufacturers uh, on the production side started to get parts. You can see there on the top left, it, uh, it's just a drill guide. Uh, the part in the middle is a trim tool for a composite part. Uh, previously, they would have had to machine something out of you know, epoxy for that and then fit it in. And then the, the one on the far right is actually a surgical drill guide. So as I say, really, as, as people within the company started to use it, other people within the company started to see it and other departments within companies started then approaches to use it for different applications. Again, I've said there that uh, for the jigs and fixtures, and this is just our own personal experience, we find most people prefer sterilithography. But for any one of those applications up there, you could use SLS or FDM. If you look at the composite side of it, you know, that's a high temperature application. So really the ceramic resins really are the only resins that suit that. Again, once you go up to volume, once you start looking at volume and you're looking for parts to get big parts made quickly, then the sterilithography, the laser sterilithography process, we personally find is the fastest. Um, a big, a very important thing is that really to get the full benefits out of any of the additive processes, your parts need to be complex. You know, if it's a simple part, having said that, um, 
you know, I know uh, Barbara has a, 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 a as a name lab, a solid concepts machine. And I was talking to the sales guy, and he actually told me that he bought a MakerBot machine just to make some templates for his machine. So, you know, the cheap machines are good, can be used for jigs and fixtures for simple parts. But generally, with the laser-based systems, with the systems that cost two hundred thousand pounds plus, you really have to have complexity in your part. Otherwise, it's a it's complete. You're not going to get the benefits out of it, you know, and you're going to feel that it's not. <coughs> It's not value for money. So uh, we would get people would come to us with sand castings. If your part can be made as a sand casting, then it's not suitable for us. If it's a part that can be machined in CNC simply, then it's not suitable for, you know, for additive manufacturing. We can make it, <clears throat> but it won't be cost effective compared to your traditional method. So what you're looking for is parts that are complex. Uh, just. I'm just showing those parts there. I mean, like we have done quite a few cylinder heads, which uh, can be made by conventional sand casting processes, but would probably take them five weeks, whereas we can do the whole thing in about two weeks from, from, from scratch to a metal part within two weeks. This was really a big game changer for <clears throat> the F1 industries, was the advance in ceramic resins within sterlithography, which didn't really take place until sometime in 2000. But it really was a, you know, it really was a huge change for the the, the impact of additive manufacturing within the UK, <clears throat> because as a result of this, uh, just over 10 years ago, 70% of cars were designed using CFD, and now, <clears throat> and only 30% was done in the wind tunnel, whereas today it's 70% wind tunnel and 30% CFD, and just down there in the bottom left, that's a sort of a typical platform that we would build for an F1 team. When they're doing it, they're maybe doing they could be doing a hundred variations of one single airfoil section on the on the car. And what actually happened within Formula One was all of a sudden they found they could use this for the wind tunnels and there was a huge interest. And then they started looking at the other processes that were available. And very quickly there was a, a very wide acceptance within Formula One, also within other industries, but particularly I'm thinking about how it has grown within the UK. <coughs> So there was a big acceptance of laser sintering within uh, the Formula One, um, and they started to dramatically increase their usage of digital. Another reason why they could, uh, another reason why it was accepted as well was that historically, sort of from you know from 1990 to the year 2000, the SLS, the powder laser process, was very unreliable. It uh, you have to heat it up to 200 degrees, and uh, I was talking to Jonathan. Earlier on, he was talking about one of the processes he has, and if he gets a draft in on the machine, it affects the quality of the part. Well, that was the big problem with the SLS. You know, you could come in after you'd set it up. We, we bought our first SLS machine in 1985, and if you had a build, you could have a build of, say, uh, 600 millimetres deep, and there's 2,000 pounds, <coughs> 2,500 euros worth of powder in that. And when you came in in the morning, you were keeping your fingers crossed that the thing hadn't heated, and it was a complete mush of plastic. And it really was the thermal controls. The machines really were very unreliable. <clears throat> but with the machine improvements and the control of the, uh, the temperature, uh, the use of SLS increased dramatically. Uh, for us ourselves, what we found was that once we found uh, you know, the machine improvements, we were actually able to sell environmental controls to people. So we actually do quite a few direct parts, parts that actually go on cars and um, mostly cars and planes, fighter planes, um, we use direct SLS. We actually produce quite a few defence parts where it's replaced traditional machining. Uh, these are just some more applications of direct data to manufacturing. This is where people, again, this was not pioneered by the Formula One, but it was developed further. If you looked at a Formula One car, you see a lot of parts on it that actually look like metal. But I would bet you any money that 50% of them are actually SLA or SLS models that have been uh, coated, nickel coated. It's absolutely, you know, again, <clears throat> a lot of people are very secretive about, you know, they want to get a competitive advantage over the, over the next person. So you, they don't want to tell people what they're doing. But a part that has been uh, plated, an SLA or SLS model, is, is as good nearly as a, not quite as a metal part, but not far off. I've put this example up just, just as a wee simple thing to sort of try and provoke a bit of thought for people. I mean, if you look there at the, um, 
you know, where, 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 where I feel additive manufacture has, a, has, has an opportunity is in, in low volumes. And if you look there, at the, those are the car sales in the, UK, in the UK in 2014. So if you look at, Lo you have Lotus, Aston Martin, and Bentley, <clears throat> who are all UK manufacturers, but their actual numbers are only less than 2,000. Now, I can't say who we do stuff for, but what I can say is that we do a lot of bespoke SLS parts that go into certain prestige cars, where maybe a rich uh, Middle Eastern says he doesn't like the way this cup, the cup is or the way his iPad fits. So there is actually quite a lot of bespoke stuff going on. Again, if you look at the indicator there, <coughs> If you look at the fact there that you have a lot of high value, low volume stuff, trains, planes, buses, a lot of those guys are buying those stuff from uh, tier one suppliers or big OEMs. They could be buying them from, you know, you have Valio, you have Volvo. They buy those as a complete unit. And quite often we have had customers send us parts, say for example, like that, that, that part there. And <clears throat> they're maybe having to buy that from whoever it is. And they're paying, say, for the sake of 50 pounds from it. But what's actually happening is they could be losing a small part on it. So quite often we've uh, had parts scanned, then sent, uh, customers actually scanned it, then sent us the part to fit it to the component so that they don't have to actually buy the 50 pound unit if they get in the shop floor or wherever or the uh, service engineer is losing them. All they have to do is just uh, order one of those units and then they just order uh, you know, the repeat parts from us. Once you get down to small parts like that, I mean, <coughs> Just trying to think of a recent job we would have done. You're probably talking a customer. What we would say to a customer: If you want to make SLS cost effective, you want to try and fill your your machine. So for something that's maybe sort of that sort of size, you know, like a, something like that, you know, you could probably get it down to about six pound a part. So, so <clears throat> it's we're only starting to see people using it, but you know, in our opinion, in my opinion, it's going to grow. Particularly a lot of customization for sort of high value parts there. Then, and, and <clears throat> I mean, over the last couple of years, particularly over the last five years, we've seen a big growth in the use of tooling. On the left hand side, there is a vacuum, vacuum form tool. And uh, we regularly produce vacuum form tools using SLS. The advantage of the SLS is that it is pro uh, it's, um, as it's porous. <clears throat> Equally, you know, you could use FDM for that. Uh, there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't use FDM. If it was single part FDM SLS, you know, pound for pound SLS is probably just marginally cheaper. But if you had 10 of them, that's when you really start to see the benefit from SLS. Because with the FDM process, which is the maker bots, if it took 10 hours to make one part, it'll take 20 hours to make two parts. With SLS, if you're making one part and it takes 10 hours, it's probably only going to take 11 hours to make two. It's only going to take 11 and a half for three. So with the uh, industrial machines, as I call them, the SLS and sterilithography, they really can be used for direct parts or for, for manufacturing. The part in the, on the right is a composite tool. And <clears throat> really, we've seen a big, a big increase in people. The, the ceramic resins not only can be used for wind tunnels, but they can be used for uh, carbon fiber tooling because they can withstand 200 degrees. I just stuck that up because uh, just Paul had said to me, <laughs> have you anything medical, Tom? So I sort of threw it in at the end there before it came down. But uh, really, that's just a very quick history of our involvement in medical. Uh, there, is, there is somebody here from an uh, orthopedic company I was talking to. And uh, as I said, I jumped down to the second one there. If I jumped to the first one, the very first medical job that we ever did was actually for the uh, Belfast City Hospital. It was for the oncology department. And it was really for the surgeons. And it was a guy down there. And he's, he, he actually works at the University of Ulster now. He worked in the, in the oncology unit at the time. A guy called John Winder, who was actually a pioneer in converting CT scans to IGES and STL files. And uh, he had sort of got interested. And he, he was trying to help the surgeons. So we did a lot of work with John in the early days of just, just producing sterilithography models. Again. You know, you could use MakerBot models, you could use any of those, any of those, to a certain extent, I would say sterilithography is redundant from that point of view because you could make a cheaper one-off piece of an ear or something than, than sterilithography. But that's, that was our early days in, in, in uh, 
medical. Then quickly we moved into orthopedic patterns for investment. And I don't know why, but <clears throat> that really sort of only lasted up to about the year 2000. After the year 2000, we didn't do, we did very little orthopedic implant. It, really, we were making them as master patterns for investment casting. And, um, you know, I'm not too sure why it died. Maybe part of it, you know, if you look at the history of uh, rapid prototyping, when sterlithography came out in the 1990s, it really did give a kick up the backside to the CNC market. And all of a sudden, the five axis CNC and the high speed machining got panicked. And there was huge developments throughout the 90s on five axis C and high speed machining. And I think to a certain extent, maybe that sort of was what happened with the orthopedic implants. You know, there's such a development on CNC machining that you could actually machine these parts quicker. I don't know. Then just, uh, we moved on to a lot of medical devices. Most of our medical device work is for prototypes, but also for initial testing. Uh, the SLA does have a USP grade four approved resin. And then, uh, we do actually, believe it or not, make direct parts. I put up their MRI scanners, but it's not for humans, it's for animals. <laughs> so we do produce production parts for a company, and I'm, I am allowed to say their name, a company called MR Solution. So we produce all the production parts for the MRI scanner for their veterinary products. We do hospital theater lights for another company, and again, we can use their name, Branton Medical. And uh, then we do a lot of anatomical models. I can't use the name of that company. But we use a combination of SLA and SLS there. I'm not going to dwell on this because uh, Paul wants to talk about it at the end. But basically, you know, that's how I see things uh, developing. Really, just if you look down here in the bottom, I'm not too sure if that's the pointer. Oh, sorry. Oops. Yeah. Basically, you know, where it says days, you know, where it says there today, SLA, SLS, DMLS, FDM, that's really where we are today, even though we've been at it. 24 years, you know, we are making, we're still making prototypes, we're making test units, we're making jigs, fixtures and tooling. I've stuck in there a company called Align, Align is a medical, it's a, an orthodontic company, and they were the first real big user of sterlithography for manufacture. They have something like 65, <coughs> 65 iPro, and they cost about uh, half a million, they cost about 600,000 euros each. And I think of about 65 of those down in South America, and all the data comes in from all over the world to make the, the master patterns for the vacuum forming of the liners. From that, we've actually had one or two dentists within the, we haven't had anybody from within Ireland, but we have from within the UK, have actually bought machines and then asked us to start making plastic aligners from us as well. If direct parts are being, day in, day out, direct parts are being made by the F1 teams. The defence companies are using it. <clears throat> the hearing aid companies, that was another revolutionary one, around about 2005, they developed a, 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 a safe resin to be used directly in the ears. And I think all custom hearing aids, all the small ones that fit inside, are all actually made by sterlithography now, although a lot of people don't know that. Um, limited runs, custom. So, you know, we can talk about it more at the end, Paul, but really, I see us here at the bottom. You know, is it three to 10 years? Is it three to 20? Is it five to 10? I'm not too sure. It depends on the developments. So that's it. Thanks for listening. Um, thanks, Tom. Some uh, very interesting points. Hopefully, we'll get to discuss some of them at the end. Um, our next speaker is uh, Ben Wood. Um, ben is a technology transfer specialist at WMG, which is uh, based in the University of Warwick, is it? That's correct, yeah. That was right. So uh, Ben deals with, a lot with uh, trying to get the actual university to link in with uh, small SMEs. So I'll leave it up to Ben. Sorry. Thank you, Paul. Evening, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk tonight. Um, now, I wanted to focus a little bit on how um, businesses large and small are actually using additive manufacturing now. Um, I know Tom's covered quite a lot of that, but this is more focused on maybe not trying to do that on a commercial basis, but how the technology can be used to help companies that maybe don't use 3D printing to, to get ahead when developing their new products. Um, so things I might say, I don't tend to put words on my slides, so I've got no script, so I might say anything tonight, frankly. Um, but I want to look, uh, talk very briefly about who I am what my job is, what I do, and why I use 3D printing. And then look a bit about additive manufacturing for industry. And as Tom broke it down, I'm going to look at prototyping, usable parts, so something that we 3D print to actually use, rather than prototype it and then move to another process. 
and then also look at some of the tooling processes that we've done, um, specifically for injection moulding, which is a pretty challenging environment for tooling, very high pressure, very high temperature. And then I'll summarise everything at the end. So briefly, WMG, I won't give you the sales pitch, but um, we're a department within the University of Warwick. We have around 350 staff now across six buildings, and our role really is to work with industry, developing research problems for maybe manufacturing, um, so big links with big automotive companies, um, aerospace companies. Um, and my specific role there is, is to work with the smaller businesses rather than the big guys like the Jaguar Land Rovers and, and Rolls-Royce of this world. So my background, um, that was my doctorate project. I started at WMG about eight years ago. Um, I did an engineering doctorate in sustainable materials for motorsport. Bit of a weird concept for a doctoral thesis, but I did get to play around with racing cars, so win. Um, and that meant I worked with a lot of really unusual materials. So composites made from marijuana, um, fuel made from chocolate, um, and equally unlikely um, kind of materials and technologies. But the thing that I really liked about that is that it got me involved with working with a lot of industrial companies. And often, how many students in the room, actually? Any students in? Fantastic. Any small businesses in tonight? Anyone small business? Two, three, there's a few. OK, very good. OK, so for the students among you, a lot of the time in university, you sit in a bubble. OK, as lecturers or students, you work in academia, you have to get your exam results. And if you're an academic, you have to write lots of journal papers. And the bit that I really liked about this project is that I got to work with lots of companies and actually understand how industry and academia could work together. Um, and that kind of resulted in me starting a job in this building. This is the International Institute for Product and Service Innovation, which is the sixth Teletubby, or IPSI. Um, and it's a crazy building. It's, it's funded by Europe specifically to work with small businesses, which is quite unique and quite odd. So we're coming to the end of kind of a four-year programme working on that. Um, and what that basically means is that in my daily life, I get to play with lots of exciting equipment in my lab, and I get to use that to help those small companies maybe overcome a manufacturing challenge. A lot of the companies I work with have only ever heard about 3D printing from the Daily Mail in the UK. And if you've read the Daily Mail, know that that is not an interesting and, and kind of useful way to learn about technology. So we like to demonstrate that technology to them and help them understand how they can work with someone like Tom's company um, to start using that technology to make them more competitive. And we've got a lot of 3D printing equipment, um, from the FDM machines that Tom talked about to a metal laser sintering machine, and down to the RepRap machines that Shane was talking about, cost like 500 pounds on eBay. So we've got everything from very little money way up to uh, a 700,000 pound machine. So we've got the whole kind of scope that we can help companies understand and make use of. So let's have a look at prototyping to start with. Tom's covered this in quite a lot of detail, but Big companies, so the big automotive manufacturers, use this to test fit and function of parts. So if they want to make their centre console for a new GM vehicle, like you can see here, they make the 3D printed part, they can check that all their components fit, that the switches fit in the right place, and that the cup holder's the right size. Okay? So a simple prototype, probably throw it away afterwards, but it allows them to, to kind of check fit and finish, form and function. Smaller companies, it tends to be a little bit different. And um, for these guys, it's generally a lot more critical so with the smaller companies, I find that they're, they're dangerously close to winning a very important contract. And having a functional prototype or something that they can show to the company they're, they're trying to deliver this product to can really help them win that business. Um, so I've got some assorted parts here that we've helped small companies to develop um, that are now successfully in mass production. Okay, so in the bottom left, you can see the, the Steek ML123 multi-lever. Anyone who's into their road biking or mountain biking, if your tyre comes off your bike um, or you've got a puncture, you need tyre levers to remove the tyre, change the tyre and everything else. Um, these guys actually did this on Kickstarter. Um, the guy I work with there is he runs a, an injection moulding company <coughs> and he's a mad keen cyclist. And he's also um, a, a very entrepreneurial guy. He decided that there was a definite niche for this, something he wanted to develop. He had the injection mold shop behind him to help him do that. But what really helped in the early stages is able to make these using an FDM machine. So um, when I'm working with companies, I don't have to worry about the industrial pressures that, that Tom does in terms of making this the most cost-effective part. We just have to make something that might work for that initial prototype. So on the FDM machine that we have, we can produce parts in a range of different plastics. Some of them are really strong. OK, um, and that means we could make tyre levers that he could actually give to cyclists, trial, test and see how they worked, get feedback and then go back through a number of design iterations. So for a company like that who are small, 
the big um, kind of risk for them is that they invest in something like an injection molten, which for this would probably cost about 50 or 60,000 the complete set. If they make a mistake on that, that's going to have a really big impact on the business. So if you pay £50,000 for an injection mould tool that doesn't produce the part that you want, that's a big disaster for the business. It might put you out of business or at least mean that some people are going to get made redundant. Okay, So for them, really, really useful. The advances in technology in ALM also mean that we can print in really different materials now. So um, we have a machine called an object, Connex, which prints in some weird resins. So we can make transparent parts. Okay, So the beacon you see in the middle is the kind of thing that goes on top of a, an emergency vehicle. Yeah, So it goes on top of a light. And it has to have a fresnel lens inside. So it has to have these little kind of ridges on the inside that spread the light and scatter the light. And that's really, really difficult to make a master part of the first time out. So normally these would be injection molded and you'd make loads of them. But if you only want one to test that the guy who's done the optical design works, that's a really expensive process to go through. So ALM, this is like Tom said, a really complex part that you wouldn't want to make any other way really for a one-off. And they can trial that, use it, uh, and see how it works. On the bottom right, that's a product that was on sale in one of the major UK supermarkets, um, supermarkets, retailers on the high street, um, before last Christmas. Um, I think they've sold around 200,000 units of this now. And this was um, helped to be developed by a little company in Birmingham. Okay? And the big thing for them is that when they go to a big retailer, the big retailer wants to know, well, I don't want to see a solid plastic part. This thing is, is rubbery. Okay? It's a cable tidy. You put the plug in the middle. You wrap your cable around it, and it's rubbery, so the cable slots into one of the little holes that you can just about see. Where are we? Just here. OK? So for that big retailer, they want it to actually be rubbery when they get the first 10 that they want to send for customer trials. And using some of the different systems available now, even the low-cost FDMs with a, a filament called NinjaFlex, you can make really flexible parts. So like Shane showed with the, the human prosthesis, um, you can make flexible parts which allow you to test something um, and actually check its function before it goes out and gets used. So all of those are successful parts. Another example of uh, how prototyping doesn't necessarily have to be done with a, a 3D printer. Um, so like Tom said, not, not everything suits 3D printing. If it's reasonably simple in shape, you're probably better off making it using another process. So this was a company who um, are mad keen mountain bikers again. A lot of cycling companies for me for some reason, I don't know why. Um, but these guys are now in their 40s, and when they go crazy downhill mountain biking, they don't like to get all muddy. Because then at the end of their mountain bike ride, the landlord won't let them in the pub. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this was a big driver for these guys. And so their initial prototype was made from bits of old metal plastic that they found lying around their garage. And they fit it all together, cable tied it onto a bike, and this has resulted in an award-winning product, which is now um, winning awards and innovation awards across a load of the mountain bike magazines. So prototyping really important, but some parts, it's not always going to be suitable to use 3D printing. It's not a magic bullet that solves everyone's problems. Okay? So first lot were parts that were 3D printed as prototypes. That one is one, an example of, of how it wasn't. Okay, um, now on to kind of direct parts, as, as Tom called them, or just usable parts using additive manufacturing. Big industry like Boeing, that's the 787 Dreamliner. Um, for these guys, some of the parts that they make um, for these aircraft, th there aren't big numbers of these aircrafts flying around. Okay? There aren't 50,000 of these in the sky. So to tool up for some of the components um, for, for high volume production is, is pretty expensive and actually not really that suitable for them. So they've actually started using 3D printing, or SLS in this case, to actually manufacture the air conditioning ducts. So that was a decision they chose at the very start of that design process for the aircraft. Benefits to them is that inside an aircraft, you sit in the nice space in the middle, but there's actually not that much space around the outside to package your air conditioning or your safety equipment, the baggage, the electrical wiring. So by being able to 3D print it, the design guys can make it really crazy shapes for the air conditioning ducting to make its way around all the wiring. Um, and because the production volumes aren't that high, it's still actually very, very cost effective compared to making tooling for any other high volume manufacturing process. So actually for aerospace, that's a really good application for it. In terms of the small companies that I work with, this was a bit of a crazy one. Um, I work with a company called Induction Technology Group, or ITG. They make really um, fancy air filters for motorsport racing vehicles. Okay, So lots of the F1 teams use ITG filters. But they also produce parts for, for road cars, people who want to modify their cars and add a filter. Um, and they had a query from Volkswagen Racing um, to basically fit something into this safety car for the Volkswagen Racing Cup. 
It looks like a Golf GTI, and it is a Golf GTI, but it has, you know, getting on for 400 horsepower. So this is a scary Golf GTI, basically. And so some of the, the things that are fine on a normal road-going car don't necessarily give you the right performance and the right airflow for, for a racing vehicle. So ITG came up with a fantastic design, um, but then that obviously needed to be tested to check that it worked. And that meant building something which would resist the temperatures, that would fit nicely in the space, um, and that would allow them to use it on track as well and do some testing. So that's the air intake that they designed, and we helped them to manufacture. That's actually in nine different components. As Tom said, size is an issue, potentially, with, with 3D printers. You, the bigger the machine, typically, the more it costs. Um, so if you want to make really, really big parts, you need a very expensive machine. Another way around that is to look at dividing the parts up and looking at ways of clipping them together. So that's actually a nine-part assembly of different components to make one airbox that sits in the car. Okay? And that was made of a material called Ultem polyetheremide, um, which would do around 140, 150 degrees continuously, which for an air intake under a, a bonnet is just about okay. It's reasonably borderline, but just about okay. Um, I did ask them not to take it out on track and do any races in it. They ignored me entirely, and I think it's probably done two to 3,000 miles um, in racing now. It also survived a trip in a plane to Australia to do some dynamometer engine testing, a trip back, and it's still going around the racetrack as we speak every time the VW Racing Cup goes out and, and does their racing. So you can produce functional parts using a 3D printer. You wouldn't necessarily want to from a cost perspective. There may be other ways to do it. But for this, which is a complicated, reasonably large part, makes a pretty good, pretty good sense to use it. They were so impressed, in fact, that this is now the production version of that, which is being sold. That's an injection molded part. The tooling, I, I can't tell you how much it cost, but it is a significant investment in tooling to achieve that. But that wouldn't have ever come about unless we were looking at a functional part that could be properly tested and used repeatedly. How am I doing for time, Paul? Are we okay? Perfect. Tooling. This is a good one, I like this. Um, I'm gonna start with big business again. So this is Unilever, very large company. Um, and I'm going to read you the press release that came out recently. With 3D printing, we are now able to apply design iterations to the mold within a matter of hours, enabling us to produce prototype parts in final materials such as polypropylene. Remember polypropylene. 40% faster than before. Um, so that's the CAG guy at Unilever, basically. Fantastic. So they made a big press release, 20th of January this year. This is one of their 3D printed injection mold tools. Very exciting. So this is using some of the polyjet resins and things like that, okay? Everyone knows what injection molding is. This is the iMechE, so that's good. I don't have to ex explain that. Um, and that's some of the parts that they've made using this tooling. Now, as I said, the challenges with injection molding are that you see very, very high pressure inside that mold tool. It gets clamped very tight together. You get hot plastic being injected in at very, very high pressure. Uh, and some of those pressures increase because you have very thin wall sections that you have to try and pack out with material. So really, a plastic mold tool is a bit of a crazy idea. It's pretty much the opposite to what we want. We want something that conducts heat incredibly well, that is very, very strong. Um, so typically, these would be a nice European steel tool. The downside to that is that the lead time for a decent tool room to make you an injection mold tool is around 8 to 12 weeks. And the cost is going to be in the probably the tens of thousands of pounds. For a car bumper tool, we could be talking hundreds of thousands of pounds of tooling. So you've got to wait a long time to do that and then you're going to pay a lot of money to have that tool invested. Now, what typically happens when you do that is that you work out after you've made the tool and made your first parts that actually you'd like it to be 5% smaller. That's pretty difficult to do when you've cut it out of metal. So doing it in 3D printing allows you to do really good design iterations. So that's big business doing it. Press release, 20th of January, 2015. This is some pictures from my workshop two years ago. Um, and this is some 3D printed injection mold tooling using an Object Connex 3D printer. Okay. What we've got here is a big set of metal injection mold tools that have basically got holes cut in them, simple hole. And then you 3D print, uh, if I can find my little, there we go. So this bit here is 3D printed, and this bit here is 3D printed. And the white plastic you can see inside is polypropylene. So we're injection molding parts into a plastic injection mold tool. Fantastic technology. Now in our case, it looks a bit confusing on the other side. The silver thing here is an aluminium, what we call a stripper plate, okay? It's not as exciting as it sounds, before anyone gets too excited. Um, a stripper plate is basically just a way of popping the parts off of the tool when it's finished molding, okay? So everything underneath that and the little bits popping through uh, are 3D printed. Now, the beauty of this is that you can design, 3D print, and be injection molding parts all in the same day. So if you're quick, this particular set of tools cost about 400 pounds. 
Um, took about four hours to make, and we were injection molding on them on the same day. They don't last forever, so there's lots of downsides to this technology. The reason that Unilever has said polypropylene is that polypropylene, in injection molding terms, is pretty much the easiest thing to injection mold. If you use kind of the wrong parameters, you'll still get a usable part out. It doesn't need to be particularly hot. You don't need to make the tool particularly hot to get a good part off of it. We've tried doing this with glass-filled nylon, um, which is pretty much one of the nastier materials to use. It's very abrasive because it's got loads of glass fiber in it. Have to get the tool nice and hot to make it work, which again is not what our, our 3D printed mold tooling wants. But for these polypropylene parts, which were like little um, clips, they had a little living hinge in the middle and a clip function at the end, we made 200 injection molded parts from that one set of inserts. So basically for us, for that particular component, the payback period is around 2,500 parts for um, polypropylene, where you'd have been better off to have a, a metal tool made. So if you want to make 1,000 parts, it's a reasonably viable process for easy plastics to mold, like maybe polyethylenes and polypropylenes, and if you're working in relatively low volumes um, with something that's not too tricky to mold. So that's an idea of how you can use kind of um, 3D printing technology to help you make parts in, in engineering plastics and production-ready plastics. One of the challenges with doing things like vacuum casting or uh, maybe using some RTV silicon tooling to cast some parts in polyurethane casting resins, which is commonly used for parts up to about a few hundred maybe, the problem with that is that they're never the same as the finished plastic that you're going to make it in if you go into mass production. So by allowing you to use this kind of technology, you can have a, a part which is actually as it will be off the finished metal tool. So it's the right shape, it's had the right shrinkage, it's in the right material. If you've got a hinge in the middle, it will work, and it has exactly the same properties. Even if we're making an ABS part, uh, an injection molding, and an ABS on an FDM machine, they won't have the same properties. Because when we injection mold it, we get nice alignment of the polymer chains, the polymer flows through, and it gives it much better strength. An ALM part will always have layers built into it, especially on an FDM machine, where it's weaker in one plane where those layers stack up. So this is really, really good for making parts for that initial evaluation. If you're a small company, when that big kind of company, your, your customer downstream says, well, okay, we want to see a thousand before we're willing to commit to paying for the tooling, you use the 3D printed tool because it only costs you a few hundred pounds. You make that initial run, you generate some cash flow by selling those, and then you have confidence that you can invest in that, that very expensive tool. Okay, guys. So, prototyping. New technologies mean that we can use a variety of different materials to help SMEs come up with a fantastic um, array of properties and function in your prototype parts. It's just not just rapid prototyping anymore where everything looks the same. We can make different colored parts with different material properties, different transparencies, and different temperature and, and chemical and strength properties. We can also make functional parts that are kind of usable in quite aggressive environments where it gets really hot, there's lots of vibration to prove out. And then finally, we can actually use 3D printing to create tooling to get us to that next step up, the volume manufacturing scale. Fantastic. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Okay, um, our last speaker, uh, just before Deborah, Professor Deborah uh, Leifer starts, um, there's a couple of sign-in sheets going around if you want to sign up. Um, it's just really for air tracking purposes in terms of uh, CPD within Engineers Ireland. So if you haven't signed in, please do. Uh, Professor Leifer is Head of uh, Urban Modelling in the School of uh, Civil and Structural and Environmental Engineering in UCD. Um, uh, Dermot Brabazon out of uh, DCU put, uh, gave me a hint to go to the uh, launch that uh, Deborah was having out in UCD in September, I think it was? October. 1st. October 1st, I wasn't too far away, um, where uh, there was a fantastic turnout, and Deborah had a couple of series of lectures from artists because she has a, a background in um, art and historic structures, um, and also a kind of a, from an engineering viewpoint. But she had a, an own presentation which was on kind of uh, potential development. So that's what I've asked. Ever to talk about this evening. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. And close things. Okay. And click her there. That's the end. Sorry. Sorry. Can we skip to the front. So yep. Okay. Here we go. Oh. 
So good evening. Thank you very much. My name is Deborah Lafer, and um, I'm a professor in civil and structural engineering at the University of College Dublin. But I also wear a second hat, uh, which is actually founder, co-founder uh, of the U3D Printing Center. We had our launch on October 1st, and we are the first fully commercial uh, service bureau in terms of 3D printing in the South. Uh, we offer all of the technologies that you've seen today, plus things like scan to print. Uh, design services and a series of classes all the way from executive level, how to get your managing director to buy into 3D printing, uh, down to what to do with your six-year-old over Easter break. So, um, so I'd like to also thank my funding agencies, which is the European, uh, European Research Council and SFI, for helping fund uh, a lot of our initial equipment and the expertise that we've developed in this area. <coughs> Um, so I was delighted when Paul asked me to talk about 3D printing because there's nothing I like talking about more. Um, and what we saw were three really excellent presentations tonight talking about where 3D printing is today and you got some hints of where things are going. But what I'd like to do is to really try to articulate uh, my vision of what that is in terms of seeing talking about some things that are obviously obvious of where the industry is going, where it's likely to be going, and then my vision of maybe where we'll be in five to ten years. So in terms of the obvious stuff, obviously the machines are getting bigger. Uh, we, many of the machines now uh, have gone from kind of an A4 size to an A0 or an A1 size, but basically a cubic meter is the limit of them. Now you saw the concrete printer uh, for the house in China. Now that and the metal printer that you saw using the welding machine, these are the dumb ends of the technology. So yeah, you can call them 3D printers, but one is basically just an arc welder on a robot, and the other is basically a Play-Doh machine. And we're not getting the benefits of the whole concept of the 3D printing and the additive manufacturing. And I, and I think as we start to go bigger, we're going to really start seeing that. Um, obviously, speed is always an issue, but also cheap. So uh, 1994, I paid $1,500 for a kind of good home and laser printer. That's what a FDM printer costs you today. Uh, five years ago, they were 15 grand, and 10 years ago, they were 50 grand. Um, and yet, what we're seeing is actually better things. So, in the same way, laser scanning, for those of you who have any background in remote sensing, same thing. So, 2000, we were paying a quarter of a million for a unit. Uh, it was slow, it was heavy. Um, today, you can get that unit for about one tenth the cost and about 10 times the functionality. And that's obviously where part of the market is going. And we're seeing that in this kind of race to the bottom in the FDM market in particular. Um, and this whole idea of things that are completely bespoke, all about me. What do I want the things around me to look at? And whether, you know, it's the case for my iPhone or it's my fitting in the car for, to hold my GPS unit, we're going to start seeing, and we have been seeing a lot more of this kind of thing. There's a lovely company here in Ireland called Love and Robots that does a lot of this for the design side. Um, if you've not been to their website, they, they have some fantastic products and I would suggest you go there. Um, and then we have, so those are the obvious ones. And then in terms of the likely ones where we already see some penetration in the industry, but not really what I would call full uptake or full exploitation of what is obviously tremendous potential. So in terms of design actualization, so this is bringing the opportunity for people to have that idea, that entrepreneur, that's SME, and they say, oh, I have this great idea, and I really want to do it, but I don't have 50 grand to do an injection mold. So I had a medical device company in the early 2000s, and we got money from National, uh, and down, uh, National Institute of Health, and I can tell you from first-hand experience that this issue of being able to make that initial prototype was the thing that stalled us. And I think that had 3D printing been financially viable and accessible and with all these great materials that we have now, I would probably still be a CEO of something called Kapoor Systems instead of standing here. Uh, but that's where we are. So I know that, that 
this technology is really important. I mean, and when I just even look at my own lab group, so we've had this 3D printing center officially open since October 1st, uh, unofficially open since the 1st of May. In that short time, we have actually filed three invention disclosures. This is more than I think our entire school has filed in the last five years. So, I mean, this is huge. You get this idea, you're actually able to go in a few hours and a few hundred euros and, and see, is this thing halfway viable? Or, or am I crazy? Or, or do I need to just revise it a couple of times? Can I show it around? How do I modify it? It completely changes that capability of bringing design into actualization. Um, the model that you see here, it's a form labs. This is kind of the bottom end of the commercial printers. We brought one if anybody wants to see it. Um, also some of these materials that were mentioned today, Ninja Flex, uh, flexible PLA. We have examples of all of that that have come out of our 3D printing hub as well as some of the metals that have come out as well. So please uh, feel free to join us afterwards. Scan to print. So this is some work that was done by a guy named uh, Keith, Keith, sorry, Keith Davis on a 3D uh, systems printer here in Ireland. He uses them mostly for things like wedding toppers. But this whole concept of scan to print, um, taking MRIs, taking CT scans, we're there already. But not that much of the industry is using it. So one of the examples I brought was a little crocodile, baby crocodile head that was taken from an MRI. Um, heard a great story about a tomb that was found. They didn't want to open the tomb. They CT scanned it and they printed all the contents. Cool. Everybody can touch the things that are inside without breaking the seal to the tomb. This is awesome. 3D sonograms. You can touch your baby before it's burn born. Hmm. Okay. So there's tremendous potential. In addition to the opportunity, you've got an existing facility, you have an existing machine, you want to modify it or you want to uh, replace a machine part that's not been, you know, it's no longer available. As Tom told us, scan it, print it. Uh, you've got an old house, you're missing part of your crown molding, scan it, print it. Okay, so people are doing this, but it's not being done a lot. We're going to start seeing a lot more of that. Um, nanoscale, macro scale. This company uh, here in Ireland, I think it's called Life Perfector. They make electrospinning machines. So working at the nanoscale, they're trying to modify their electrospinner to be a 3D printer. Now, we already know there's a fellow in Germany for his PhD who did this, so it's possible. And we're going to start seeing more and more of this. So nanoscale, macroscale. Right now, we're kind of in between. Uh, tomorrow's 3D printing, huge stuff in medicine. Now we've talked, I mean, we've here just even in Ireland, we have uh, Stryker, Osteoantica, uh, oh, sorry, Osteoanchor, and I think there's one more, I'm going to get in trouble for not mentioning the third one, uh, that does titanium bone implants. It's a big market, but this is just the beginning. The FDA has recently approved transplanted skin grown from 3D printing. Transplant it, you know, people are growing organs, kidneys, livers. Uh, there was a trachea that was recently devised. We are just seeing the beginning of this. So, yeah, planning surgeries, these kind of things, these are great. Um, inserts for cranial reconstruction, fantastic. But, but we, we don't even know the beginning of where we're going with this. 50% uh, of the work that comes into our 3D printing hub is on the biomedical side. And whether that's devising new wheelchairs or new inserts to retrofit shower stalls for people who have fallen or syringe holders or rectal uh, ports, these kind of things. People in the medical community see the value not just on the, on the spoke side, but actually on the kind of innovative, being able to try things in multiple ways, multiple times. Uh, textiles. So this is interesting. You see a lot of people who talk about 3D printing clothes, and we saw an example of it. Well, unless you're Lady Gaga, you're not going to be wearing this stuff. So 40%, <laughs> sorry, over 50% of the people at the Electronics Consumer Show recently held in Las Vegas uh, said that they wanted a 3D print, they would want a 3D printer in their home. Cool. 40% of those said, when asked what they would print, they said clothing. Meh. 
Wrong answer. Can't do it. We currently do not have filaments that are what I would call textile quality. So it raises the question to me, why are we not hooking up the existing incredible capacities we have with things like flatbed knitting machines. So this is a machine by Stoll over in the Midlands. They were very nice and gave us quite a tour of their facility. I mean, people would argue that knitting machines are actually the first 3D printers, but we, we have that gap. But I don't think that gap is for much longer, okay? Um, food. So we saw the pizza. Fine, great. I'd like a 3D omelet, no problem. Uh, this is a little different. This is a company out of Cambridge called Dovetail. It was devised for elderly population where they're looking at actually putting in nutrients into a food format that's easy to eat. Um, so they're, they're kind of little gelatin balls. They drop into water and then they kind of glom onto each other. It tastes like jello. It's not bad. I don't think I'd want to eat it every day, but um, but you know, if anybody remembers from sci-fi from the 70s or the Jetsons or whatever, you know, punch in the. Uh, I think actually our first speaker had a, a, a picture of a 3D printed food kind of thing. Um, why not? Uh, certainly on on an airplane on a flight over seas for 14 hours to actually have some choice. Wow, I think I'd eat 3D printed food then. Hmm. Okay, uh, but where I really think we're going in terms of, you know, 10 years out is that 3D printing will become 4D printing. So many of you probably have seen this MIT uh, Media Lab clip on YouTube uh, where they have a material that they print and I can't remember if they put it in water or something and it changes shape and it spells out MIT, very cute. Uh, but this is where we're going. There's already a whole batch of materials out there on the market that are sensitive to UV, that are dissolvable in water, and it's, you know, um, can be conducting electricity or magnetic. And it's just a matter of harnessing these and pushing that envelope of these filaments. I mean, we're getting new filaments on the market on nearly a daily basis. And so what I see is that these can be used to develop products that are environmentally or time sensitive in a way that's quite useful. So maybe they just actually dissolve and disappear after six months. So you buy your kid a toy, ah, don't use it in six months, goodbye. No waste. So, um, so in the same way people talk about maybe buildings changing to respond to wind, well, why can't the things we wear respond. You know, if uh, a coat is better in sun or better in water, better in cold, why can't it be changing its properties in response to us? Okay, regulation. So right now 3D printing is like in the wild west. People are out there doing God knows what. And I'm not talking about the 3D printed guns because if I'm going to hurt somebody I'm going to go make myself a Molotov cocktail mm -hmm. with a beer bottle. So. I'm talking about if we want to move from prototyping to actual product delivery into what people call zero defect manufacturing, we're going to have to get on board with regulation. So right now, the only area that has truly embraced this is 3D dentistry. So there's an ASTM committee all about 3D dentistry all other industries are going to have to engage in this. So th there's a few other ASTM committees on, on metals that look at some, some issues on processing, but we're going to have to get with it. I was pleased to see last week there was an announcement of a company in Italy that has offered to do certification for filaments. Boy, as a 3D printing retailer, I would love if this w had some meaning behind it. I don't know, they're brand new, but if we had a standard and there was a company that would test these things, and then um, there's a couple of local filament companies and other uh, local vendors here tonight, uh, and I, I would adore, because I spend a lot of time, people come in, they say, oh, will you carry our filament, will you use our filament, and then we have to actually test it. It's a big investment. Okay, so obviously we don't want to handcuff people and we want to see this incredible industry continue to be amazing. Uh, but there's got to be a little bit of a reality check going on. Okay. Um, production on demand. Okay, so 
We talk about being able to, 15, 20 years ago, people talked about print on demand. You'd go into a bookstore, there'd only be one copy of every book, it would just be a sample, and you would push a button and it would get printed for you right there. Your newspaper would get printed for you at the newsstand. Not, okay. Uh, but bookstores now carry a lot less books and there are hubs that actually do print on demand and you get the print three days later or a week later. So we are seeing changes in the retail section in terms of production on demand. Uh, and if you think about things like a carbon tax, ooh, uh, what if we charge people for having to move products from one country to the other? Um, all of a sudden, things like reshoring becomes a, a huge advantage. So yeah, 3D printing may be more expensive, but it seems crazy that you make a product in a part in one place, you ship it to another place to be assembled, you ship it to another country to get finished, and then you ship it back to the initial country to get purchased. This, this does not make a lot of sense. Um, and in the same way, there's a lot of movements that people want to eat food that's been grown locally. I think we're starting to see, particularly with 20-somethings, they want to buy clothing, they want to buy other products that are manufactured locally with local resources. Um, recycling. There is already a machine on the Chinese market that actually, I've not touched it, I've not seen it, so I don't know, but the claim is that you put the bottle in the top, the old soda bottle, and you produce the filament and the product in the same machine. Why not? Recycle all of our waste into metal machines, into plastic machines, into paper machines. Um, I think that this is a real possibility and, and makes a huge amount of sense. Um, response enabled stuff. So this is where we're actually printing embedded sensors, things that would be very difficult to do in traditional manufacturing in a complete way. But this is gonna change, require changes in how we think about our materials and our production machines today, because they're very kind of singular product. Maybe you've got two print heads. We can't print the formwork for concrete, print the concrete, and print the rebar from the same machine. Well, we could. Maybe my next ERCSET student will do that. Okay. Um, what about enhancing functionality? Piezoelectric shoes. Uh, generating energy and things as we're walking to maybe power our cell phones, other things like that, that increasingly there is a huge amount of ideas out there. I teach um, programming to the second years um, at UCD and I ask them, because a lot of them are civil engineers, mechanical, and they're like, oh, I gotta let learn programming this semester. Well, you know, I don't wanna be a computer scientist. And I said, well, I want you to come up with an idea of why, what, we, what would you program? Something in your life. And one guy said, he said, I would program a wristwatch that told your body signals to go to sleep. And I said, wow. I said, when you become the next Bill Gates, I said, will you endow this building? I said, every person who takes a cross, you know, a, a cross Atlantic flight would love something like that. You get on the plane, sleep. Eight hours later, wake. Wow, okay. So there are all these people out there with these amazing ideas and if we can start embedding some of those into our production capacity, will be really incredible. Um, point of generation consumption. So this goes again, not to just reshoring, favorite word of President Obama, but actually bringing production back to the local community so that the community that is using the product is where this product is being produced. And we have this brilliant example of this in electricity. So there's this whole framework that's being developed in many countries for microgrids, where people are being encouraged to put on solar panels, wind turbines, um, a, a thermal piles. They're using the gener the energy generated for their own use and selling back to the energy grid. Well, why can't we do production the same way? Hmm, okay. Um, 
Structural optimization. So it takes $60,000 to send one kilo of material up into space to the space station. Every kilo of material on an airplane, 30,000 euros over its lifetime. Uh, 50 kilos on a car costs 2% um, of fuel efficiency. But we're not using the advantages of 3D printing. So as Tom said, there's all this stuff that 3D printing could print, but why bother? Except you've got small runs. What we want to push people to do is to embrace the true design optimization that could happen because it's no harder for the 3D printers to print these amazing geometries. Okay. Um, and my last one, which I'm going to describe in kind of two components, is what I call fully integrated manufacturing. So if you think about how can a 3D printer, like the ones we have out here, work in terms of a traditional assembly line? Pretty hard. Well, there's a company in the UK that's already doing it. It's called Tammy Care. They make um, specialty undergarments for women with incontinence. And they actually basically have a 3D printer uh, system on an assembly line in a room that's about the size of this where the assembly line basically goes all the way around the room. So they're able to do it. Um, I don't think that's really the future. Um, I think that 3D printing continues to be too slow for things like that. Where I see it's more likely to go is with companies like Rofin and stuff like that, where you've got already other capabilities in CNC, um, in high-end laser cutting, and the integration of 3D printing into their other technologies. So not too long ago, we all had a scanner, a printer, and a copier in our office. Not anymore. Okay, so this is what I see as the future. And in terms of our own future at U3D, we're getting a 260 V Eden um, object on Friday. So we'll finally be able to print rubbers, not just Ninja Flex and, and uh, plastic PLA. So we're absolutely delighted about that. So thank you very much for your attention. Um. Uh, I would just uh, ask the um, speakers to, if they can come up to the um, stage here, um, and while we get set up, sorry, um, our next event is on the 11th of March, where we have the IMEC E uh, Railway uh, Chairs uh, Address. Um, this is held in conjunction with the actual railway group here within Engineers Ireland, so that will be at half six. Um, so the event will be on the actual uh, Engineers Ireland website, um, basically, hopefully tomorrow. Anyway, um, first of all, uh, questions, if you can just put up your hand, um, somebody will be going around with a microphone. I actually have to put this microphone for the speaker here. If you can introduce yourself and also um, just address or uh, indicate who you want the actual question addressed to, if that's okay. So, any questions? <coughs> God, no one's volunteered. Okay, uh, Chris, down here. So, um, my question is directed at Deborah. Um, my name is Chris McLellan. I'm a student in IT Tala. And one of the things I noticed about your presentation was about recycling-based manufacturing in the future. Where do you see that that going, like in terms of plastics and metals? Well, we're doing it already. Um, for 189 euros, you can buy a philostrator, and you can take all of your leftover little bits from your existing parts, and you can even take plastic bottles or pellets and, and shred them and feed them and make your own um, filament. Now, it's not as gorgeous as the stuff I buy, uh, but boy, for a lot of stuff, particularly if we're teaching classes, working with kids, pioneering some stuff, it works pretty well. So um, there's an example of where we're, we're already doing it. Mm -hmm. So. Just, can I add on with the, just 
Sorry, we, we, we also have a filler bot, but I think the challenge on that is the actual shredding of the plastic. Uh, because it's grand, it's actually quite easy just to extrude like your standard pellets, whatever. But it's the grinding up of the old plastics, and grinding of plastic costs it costs energy. So you have to kind of look at it from from that side as well. There's a cost to it too. So and also there's yeah the grinding at the moment is still not. There's some systems out there, but they're <coughs> slow. And I think it's something that could be developed. It's an area that needs to be developed in terms of recycling. So. Quick one from me as well on that. Um, challenge for, for an industrial purpose with that is that every time you recycle a polymer, you're potentially degrading its pro properties a little bit. So that does level off over time. So after you've been through that process maybe four or five times, that's, that's fine, um, and you kind of level out. Another thing to think about is that if you have any contamination, so if Deborah's been printing maybe four different filaments and you put all of those into your fill extruder to make your filament, what properties are that plastic going to have? So it's fine for doing some teaching and things like that, but if you're making a part which is going into an aircraft, you obviously need to be very careful about what material you're using. So it's a big challenge for industry to understand, to deal with waste, as it is in, in most plastics manufacturing. I think, though, it's a good... It's actually something... The reason we're looking at is less for industry, more for, say, third world and, and um, countries like that, so where there's a lot of plastic waste. Like we, w Plastic is a huge problem in our world. Like We have a lot of kind of waste of plastic, and it's not being recycled properly, especially in developing and, and sort of third world countries. So for them type of countries, it can be it could be a big enabler if we can have a, an efficient system for grinding and recycling and using that directly for print but for industry it's a bit the quality wouldn't really be yeah like you said so it's an interesting one um can i ask a question um what you got I'll, I'll just this question to ben because he's in working in a university how do you get that interaction between uh, like the university and smes because I think that's always, a, uh, like, there's a couple of academics here in the audience, I know, and I think that that's always the thing that puzzles me. How do you get that to work? That's a very good question, actually. It's, it's a tricky thing to do in a university environment, because typically, if you're a university researcher, your job doesn't really involve working with industry. So in your job description, it will say you need to publish lots of papers, and you need to supervise lots of PhD students, and you need to bring in lots of research funding, and that's your job. So... If you're spending 20% of your time working with companies, that can be really tricky to achieve. So the way around it that, that we found at WMG is actually that my job is just to work with small businesses. I don't publish any papers, so it's not in my job description to do that. So it kind of you need to have someone whose specialist job is to do that. Let everyone else do the research. Um, and often research needs to generate impact. Okay, so it needs to have an impact on the community. It needs to have a, a good thing to happen to the economy and, and for industry. So having people whose specialist job is to use the research that the other guys in the university are doing and to help to, to transfer that into industry is a model that we found works, works quite well. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> uh, in the north, um, Invest NI has just helped fund a thing called NIAS, which is the Northern Ireland Advanced Competence Centre. And the idea of that is to, to get SMEs to join and uh, <coughs> come up with projects so um, in it, there's probably about 10 companies. Uh, there's three companies, roughly the same size as ourselves, which is 24 people. And then you have the likes of um, Bombardier, <coughs> which would be 6,000 people, and uh, Right Bus, five or 600 people, and um, there's another one or two. So why did, why did I join it? As a, so I joined it because it actually costs us a, a, it costs a five-figure sum. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was... Uh, we don't have the, um, you know, we don't have the time to do R and D. So we decided to join because we thought it was an opportunity for us to avail of the universities. So we can, as a company, we could put forward a project. So, for example, you've mentioned recycling. So we're not involved in the project, but there is a recycling project going on within the IAS for peak plastics. Um, <clears throat> we decided not to go into it because we have to put a benefit and kind cost into it, so it does cost us money. But it was one that we would like to have gone into. We've gone into another project. And what we're going to gain is we're going to learn the knowledge as an SME, you know, in terms of, in the particular one we're going into, we're going to learn knowledge on composites. Mm. The one disadvantage that uh, the NIAS has at the moment, I mean, I think it got £5 million from InvestNI to, to fund. And the idea is that 
if uh, Invest and I put in, say, £200,000 towards the university's cost, the university is 100% funded, then the rest will come from industry. The one disadvantage for it is that they're not prepared to fund uh, capital costs, they're only prepared to fund, fund the students and the academics. And for me, that is a disadvantage because uh, we were hoping that you know, we might have been able to fund some of the high-tech prototyping machines out of the manufacturers. But it is a good idea, you know, and it's in its infancy. Mm. And uh, I think it will succeed, you know, mm. just when you were saying about, so, you know, if you could get Enterprise Ireland to fund a joint uh, mm. competence centre or something, I think it, 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 it would be a good, you know, a good start. Good. Would, would you would you see that like I mean I'm kind of I work in education so is there is there like like is there a direction that we should be taking in education in this kind of in this arena like uh, things that I wrote down were part complexity materials like that that was hit a number of times like and uh, like goes back to maybe what Shane said at the very beginning and what Deborah hit at the very end as well is the design. Like you know, this kind, this idea of additive manufacturing, 3D printing, wherever, you know, it's this design might give us a leading edge somewhere along the line. So, yeah. Uh, maybe I can turn the question around, and maybe the message should be to go out to the SMEs to say that there are funding mechanisms, such as through Enterprise Ireland, to get innovation vouchers to come to the universities. Mm -hmm. And we have some amazing people across the island working in 3D printing, in material developments, in uh, filaments, in new machines, in um, high-grade powders, metal powders, um, you know, or they can just come to the 3D printing center and get something printed. So you can get a voucher for up to, I think, 10,000 if you're an SME. Um, and that's a way to bring in um, that interest. And it also sparks our ideas and has that opportunity for future collaboration. So f for those of your membership that are out there who might be thinking, oh, I want to start a company, or boy, I have this idea, but I just don't have the capital to get started. There is money out there, at least here in the South. Okay. Um, there's a question here, over here somewhere. Um, yeah, this is a, an open question, obviously, but just, uh, Deborah, you mentioned it, or alluded to it in your presentation about functional filaments, functional materials. Uh, with respect to that, then what's your opinion on 3D printer manufacturers locking you into only using their materials? Because, obviously, it, it, you're limited then in, in terms of the designer's choice, what materials you can use, where you know this material may exist elsewhere, but you haven't got the very expensive machine because you blew last month's budget on your opposing machine. Yeah, um, and this is a challenge, um, and I think that eventually what will happen is we will start to see competitors come in. Now, whether you're going to violate your warranty for a quarter million machine, I don't know. But it's one of the reasons why we actually have a whole range of machines to deal exactly like that. Uh, I mean, and what we found is like for our farm labs that the Maker Juice, which is the uh, a third party uh, material supplier for that, it actually often works better than the stuff that Form Labs is. Uh, providing, though they are actually innovating a lot of new materials. Now, I also have to say that a lot of these machines where you are locked in to those materials, like Stratus and MLab, of which we have machines, I mean, these are fabulous machines, and they always print right. And I can leave them at night, and I can come in the next morning, and I know everything's going to be great. So you get what you pay for, to some extent. Um, that said, you know, we're very interested and we're always buying new filaments and Lewu and Laybrick and all this stuff and PET and stuff with carbon nanofibers. Uh, so, as I said, it's still really the Wild West out there uh, to a lot of extent. And as uh, I think some of my colleagues here uh, mentioned, that the last of these patents are expiring in the next two years. And we're going to start seeing an explosion in, in some areas, the same way we did five years ago with the FDM machines. I mean, I know that there is going to be a low-cost, good metal printer out there, you know, something under five grand in the next five years. There's got to be. There's a huge demand for it. Yeah, it's not going to be able to print microfluidic channels, but maybe I want to print door handles. So. Yep. 
Yeah, I, I think it's a good point. I think it comes back to where the whole regulation of things like, so standard like kind of paper printers, the whole thing was you're locked into print cartridges, but 3D printing is quite different. And one of the reasons, again, I like the low cost systems is because we can just explore them so much with different filaments. We can create what, whatever we want and put it in there. But I think we should, like if we're thinking about like regulation on a kind of a global scale, we should try to not limit people like that. So. Um, try to push the manufacturers that they, that they should be, we'll say there, sh there should be some kind of body saying, you know, you have to allow people to use this certain filament, you have to be certified to use this range of different filaments so people aren't locked in like that. So I think it's a good point on the kind of the regulation side, so, yeah. Yeah, sorry, just, I'm <coughs> not an expert on the, I'm not an expert in the filaments, so I'm not too sure what the, goes on in that, but on the SLS and the powders, you can use any powder you want in the machine. And I mean, we have done particular formulations for customers. We've worked with a company called Excel Tech in France. So if you came to me and said a particular polystyrene or a particular polyprop, we could probably work with another company to do that. So that does go on. And the big excitement is, you know, the metal centering. There's, you can use whatever powders you want on that. There's absolutely no limitation. So there's like, a, and, and, and in actual fact, we have, you know, we're just getting into the metals and we think companies are going to come to us and say, we want to do some metal development with you. So the filaments, I don't know what goes on there. Stylothography, you are tied in. Um, you weren't historically tied in, but you are tied in now. But we actually do run DuPont resins and, and 3D systems resins because some of our machines aren't locked. I think just one very short point on that is that it's worth bearing in mind that the manufacturers of the machines actually do an awful lot of development work in pushing that technology, and they need to get their money back. So by locking you into their materials, they help to, to offset some of that R&D budget. So you're right, it's really good if it's open, um, and you have the opportunity to do that. But equally, we want the guys who are the big players in the industry to keep spending money on development. And if they're losing that profit on material, then potentially that won't happen. And the argument there is just who you want to do the development work, whether it's, it's research organizations and people at home, or whether it's the guys making the machines. And ultimately, if you want to play with materials, that will kind of help steer your choice of what kind of system you might want to go for. Any other questions? Um, Philippa? Hi, Philippa. Uh, or am I Mickey? Um, tip, one of the advantages of 3D printing is, is that you can remove component design. It becomes assembly or replace an assembly with a single component. And one of my sort of areas of uh, I don't understand how this works in terms of previously engineers have designed for um, structural integrity and design for manufacturer um, and now obviously if you're 3d printing a part you can change the way you design something so that's fine if you've got a, a 3d printer that you can use and test but how are you going to teach engineers who have been in the profession for a long time to design things that can be 3d printed so that's where I think organizations like ICMR um, really come in, where you've got an organization that has the ear of industry, that has the uh, membership, and to start developing curricular materials with them, which is something that we're doing. But that education has to happen at lots of levels. I mean, I remember back in the 1980s, you had all these kids coming out of hot colleges like Carnegie Mellon with CAD, trying to go into architecture firms. And the boss is going, hmm, I don't know about this. <laughs> but everybody does CAD and architecture now, so. Just to uh, pick up on your point there, <coughs> GE um, installed the cheap uh, FDM type, I don't know what, maker bots or ultimakers. They installed those in every single design office in the States. And the idea was to get the young engineers because you talked about design for manufacture. You know, I had two years in Boeing, and one of the great things when I went to Boeing was I was straight out of university, very theoretical. I, I didn't know what a CNC machine was, and, and Boeing set me down onto the shop floor to show me how you actually make these things on <laughs> the cost of fortune. So when I came back, I, was, I thought it was fantastic. I knew how we actually made things, and I was designing things to make for CNC. But now what we actually do need to do is actually turn that totally around, and we need to get people thinking, you know, just make it on a 3D printer. You can't make it with traditional methods. You've got to start looking at metal printing or other technologies. You know, so it's, it's going to be very difficult, but you've got to get, and to me, the big benefit is going to be with the young people, because when I started, I was 31, and I thought, you know, 
how are people going to make these things? We were making them 3D printers, and now I'm realizing actually the printers with metal printers and stuff, you've got to completely think the opposite. Don't be thinking, how do you make it? I mean, and, and, and as a result of GE installing the 3D, uh, cheap 3D printers, they're now, they've installed, I think, uh, 20 or 30 metal printers to make one particular component that's going to save them hundreds of thousands of pounds, you know? So I would say, <laughs> give every student <laughs> an automaker if you could, you know, and get them into companies, get people thinking, you know, it's a different way of designing, you know. Um, Professor Burr. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Jerry Byrne from UCE Engineering. Uh, I, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the division because I think it's an absolutely excellent evening and the four presentations were really superb, well, well done. Uh, I, I'm very interested, Tom, in your company. Uh, I think it was mentioned in 1991, first of all, it was founded. Uh, the first patent, I think, from Chuck Hull was in 1980, something, 86. So you were very short, you very early days. Uh, so I'm just interested in hearing uh, the, how your company is developing and uh, where it's going to now. Uh. Yeah, I thought that was you there, Jerry. I wasn't too sure. <laughs> but I remember, remember the times we came up here and there was yourself and I think, uh, was it Sean McEntee from yeah. Laserform and Dragon? Yeah, <clears throat> from our point of view, like, you know, my background was engineering and to a certain extent when I went into the th rapid prototyping, I actually was sort of going into model making nearly, it was nearly come back, whereas now I see a change, and for our, from our point of view, we see ourselves as an engineering company now, you know, whereas in the 90s we were rapid prototyping, we still have a very, uh, we have a, you know, a very skilled model making team in the company. So for us, we sort of want to aim to be, you know, 40% of our parts are additive manufacturing, or, or what I call direct parts, or uh, tooling. For us as a company, like, um, you know, with all these cheap printers, like, you know, we get a guy sends us in a part to quote and we go back and say it's 600 euros and he says I can buy a printer for that, you know, so <laughs> go and buy it, you know. <laughs> what we're doing is our stuff is, is it's better materials, uh, better accuracy, and it's when it comes to volume, you know, like it's like the part for the back, for the clip, for the indicator on, you know, if someone wants... 60 or 50 of those, you know, we can produce those cheaply. If they come for one, it's not going to be so cheap. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for a company like us, you know, in 10 years' time, I would hope all our work's going to be, you know, manufacturing added, you know, all productions and production parts and tooling parts. Mm -hmm. That's where I see it. But it's not going to be fast because, you know, like <coughs> in 1996, we did a part for Bombardier. It was a tooling part that actually was for, a, 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 for an airflow duct. And at that time, you know, we never heard from Bombardier for another 15 years. But yet, you know, that guy, the guy, the guy who contacted us in Bombardier at the time, you know, we've been in presentations. It was actually a guy, a manufacturing engineer, had seen an article about us in the Belfast Telegraph and rang up and said, could you make this duct? And we said, yes, no problem. Uh, and he said, how long would it take? And we said, four days and produced it for him. And he used that as a master pattern. He, he, it was a component that they were getting from Brazil and they didn't have the drawings. And I thought, Flip, you know, here's a presentation. We're going to see more of them. And we should have seen more of them, but we didn't, yeah. you know. So because it didn't have the profile that it does now, but with the profile now, people are thinking, you know, of new applications. You know? Thanks, yeah. Thanks. Uh, at the back over there. Hi, I'm Ryan D'Souza. I'm a final year uh, mechanical engineer in UCD. And I was wondering, it's an open question, I was wondering what your advice would be for graduating engineers to get into the industry? Buy <laughs> 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 <Quite> a machine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, very quickly, it depends if you want to get into the 3D printing industry or make use of 3D printing. Because they're two very different questions, I think. So getting into the 3D printing industry. The oh, over to you, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose one of the things you could, you know, one of the things I would say is, uh, you know, get involved in it at the university, but then I would say also contact companies direct, you know. Um, you know, just contact companies direct. And, and uh, I mean, like, there are user, con there are conferences. So, like, I would say, you know, for... Uh, in our industry, I don't know, there's a big conference in America called the AMUG, Additive Manufacturers Users Group. You know, okay, 
a student couldn't afford it, but you might be able to convince them. You want to go to Time Compression Technologies in, in, in Birmingham, is around about November time. You have the Rapid Prototyping Conference in the University of Nottingham every year. It's, it started out in 1991, it's still going. Uh, I mean, there's bound to be other conferences. Um, Think of a master's project. There's six people in your department who are interested in 3D printing, all the way from modifying machines to making materials. Go do a master's in it, and you will have any job you want. There are no people out there. Stratasys is actually pushing the government of Ireland, the government of Germany, and the government of the US to institute large-scale curriculums because they cannot hire people who have any experience. When we look to hire somebody for our 3D printing center, we just decided, well, we're going to take somebody from Jobsbridge, so basically off the dole. So we took somebody from traditional printing, uh, because there was nobody out there. We were going to have to train them anyway. So we took somebody who already knew how to deal with materials and had some customer base and how to fix things, and he's been brilliant. For those of you who have met Brian, who's with us is now five months, six months, and he's just brilliant. But there's nobody out there to hire. So it's a, it's a brilliant area, but go do a master's and show that you have some expertise, and then you can sell yourself to the companies. Just like to say, so one of the things I was at my end of the presentation was about education, and I think basically like the 3D, like like I was saying, it's it used to be the manufacturer, and there was you know basically 3D printing doesn't require, we'll say, as much input in terms of knowing the process, so the 3D printing should just happen. So the real gap is the modeling side. So it's someone basically someone that can think just about you know design whatever, create whatever crazy shapes and whatever way the air is going to flow around internal and the part and stuff, that's the person that will be, you know, the designer of the future, like that's, and coming up the upskilling thing and all the stuff, it's, it's all about the modeling, you know, the 3D printing should, it's, it's it, you know, you, you're not going to need to know as much as say, someone that's like a five axis machine specialist or something, it's not the same thing, it's, it's bringing it back to the model, there's, there's, you should think no limits, like, like you were saying, there's, should be no limits, so. So, yeah, so that's all. Yeah, just one we, we just took on an application session here, <laughs> and uh, you're asking, you know, so we actually had quite a good response from it. But the one guy who got the job, uh, what sold it for us, actually, even though maybe there was other very, very good people, was the fact he came in with a piece that he'd made on his own machine, his, <laughs> his own maker bot. He came in with a couple of pieces. And because he had actually used that, he was able to talk to us about STL files, he was able to talk about support structure, he was able to talk about problems that he had with his thing. And whilst he hadn't actually done it, you know, worked anywhere, it actually shown, showed us a real keen interest in the technology, you know. So people are looking for people who are sort of excited. About, for people like me, I'm looking for people who are excited about the technology and want to work in the industry. So, you know, I think that if you can get involved in that, you know, at university, it'll, it'll really help you. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? Just there at the back, John. Um, j just uh, John Lancaster retired, but I used to work with locomotives in Bombardier as well in Africa and overseas all my life. And the question arose of many a time you'd have a locomotive stop for spare part, which would take months to come, and I mean months. So. <laughs> Ideally, you'd have your 3D printer based in Dar es Salaam or Nairobi or somewhere, and you could get that part made. Now, my question is, what sort of um, materials can be used? Say, can you make a turbocharger bearing or something like that on a 3D printer? And you mentioned cylinder heads, um, that sort of venue of items. Thank you. Um, can I just put in on that question? Um, it's a really interesting question because, um, like, I've, I've, as my colleagues know, I have a tendency to leave Financial Times articles around people's desks, and uh, the Financial Times always has something about 3D printing, and they had a, oh, they had a recent article about standards, like you know, for federal aviation standards, like can we make parts? Can we make parts the same, to the same quality as traditional <coughs> manufacturing? And I think it kind of relates back to that, is that if you're going to ship a part or make a part locally, can you then guarantee its functionality? And I, I, like I know it's addressed in kind of Deborah's and Shane's and uh, Tom's hinted at it as well as in terms of standard parts. So um, 
maybe you can try and answer. I'll kick off. <laughs> I'm sure everyone else will put in as well. What I'd say is depending on, on the path that you're trying to create, tolerances and accuracies are, are very good that you can achieve. Um, but typically with things, especially if we're talking about metal parts, typically for certain surface finish, especially bearing surfaces, you probably need to do some post-machining. Now, Tom might disagree with me here. You'd be needing some kind of machining process, but what you can do is take out the vast majority of those processes where you start with a billet of material to get down to something which is very near the final shape. Um, so you can get down to, to very good tolerances, and the materials you can use within metal sintering processes are really good. The modern machines are also achieving above 99% density. So older parts, maybe 10 years ago in metals, would be um, quite porous. Um, so they'd be worse than a, a cast part in some respects, whereas now they're, they're approaching rot in terms of the mechanical properties. So you can produce something good, but it might need finishing if you've got very tight tolerances or, or fits to think about. So. Yeah, actually, that's kind of coming back to what I was saying at the, the very start was like, hybrid, so see, it's more, we're talking about hybrid processes, so uh, additive, especially for the metals, like you're saying, like the additive manufacturing is a huge advantage, but we're still going to need other processes in there for finishing, say, grinding or machining, but it's about building sort of hybrid uh, machines like Marasiki have, have looked at with their, um, uh, their laser tech, whatever, that basically prints the part and then it can it can machine away and it can print onto a billet and stuff. So I don't think it would be solely a 3D printer that would be installed. It would be a hybrid material processing center. We'll call it something like that. So. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, in actual fact, the, the whole rapid prototyping was founded on a, a grant from the US Navy to make a machine to make spare parts while the ships were out at sea back in the 80s, and that's where Chuck Hall originally got some of his funding for. But could you do that today? No, you couldn't, what you're looking for. But, uh, I mean, and this bit of what Jay is asking me, where does he see us? Well, one of the things that really excites me now that didn't excite me <coughs> 10 years ago was the sort of developments that Shane's talking about, those, um, what do you call them, that uh, oh, Japanese, the, oh, the yeah, Marisiki. the Marasiki. So, like, uh, not only Marasiki, but DMG, they're making these combination machines whereby it's a combination of either laser melting or electron beam melting and CNC. So you're getting, like uh, the first time I saw it, it actually was an injection mold tool for Nokia, <coughs> and it had all the conformal tooling. So part 10 millimeters, it then post-machined it, and then back into another 10 millimeters. So you had a, a tool, an injection mold tool, that could produce like maybe say four or five million parts of it built within within a, you know, a matter of a week, you know. Uh, so it's not there yet. That's where we're hoping it'll go. And that's one of the things that really excites me, Jerry, is the sort of combination machines. Um, but to go back to the, actually the basis of your question of what can you print in? Almost any metal. Now, some of the machines do only reactive, only non-reactive metals. So you are printing in some type of nitrogen atmosphere. The other ones do reactive metals, and you're printing in an argon encapsulation. But you can print in inconol. So this is what they make jet engines out of. Uh, and if you look at the M-Lab concept laser, they're large-scale machines. They're cubic meter machines. Their production line for next year is already completely sold out, and they doubled their production capacity last spring. So, I mean, the, the potential is enormous. Okay. Um, I think, are we done? Yeah, we are. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, I'd like uh, just a final round of applause for our speakers. <laughs>